of whatever they has been, is, or will be, has always existed within it, as the oak tree has always existed within the acorn. And within this magnificent, total, monadic unity, all qualified existence rises and falls, begins and ends. But that which is this monadal substance cannot rise or fall, cannot begin or end, and is referred to by Plato as the eternal animal. It is animal from anima, meaning the animated being, or the eternal world soul, crawling forever through space. Having bestowed upon this, therefore, one peculiar power, the Greek felt he had done about all he could. He had bestowed upon this all, <laughs> the term all. It is everything. It is not a being, nor is it not a being. It is not a place, nor is it not, not a place. It may be considered as an energy, as a substance, as an essence, as a principle, as a force, as a law, as a substance. In all these things you are naming aspects of it, but you cannot string enough words together to name the substance of it, for it is the essence behind all aspects. Therefore, to say that it is alive would not be truly true, because then it would be susceptible of death, or death could exist. It is not alive in the sense that it was never not alive, or it will ever cease to be alive. It is. It exists. The Egyptians called it tat, T-A-T, from which we have our word that, T-H-A-T. It is that. Whatever you look at, wherever you turn, whoever's face you gaze into, that is that, with a capital T. <laughs> wherever you see, you are seeing nothing but the substance of essence. You are seeing nothing but the extension of this divine thing. Well, the Greeks did not call it divine, because to them, this in itself was an artificial designation. The moment you call something divine, you set up a contrary situation, or what the Hindu has with his shaktis, or polarized divinities. If you say God is divine, then something else is not divine. If you say this deity is better than all other deities, then you again make a mistake, because we are dealing not actually with moral levels, we are dealing with reality with plain, unvarnished reality, being as it is. And consequently, this thing as it is has a virtue of reality. And the virtue of reality is greater than the virtues of right or the vices of wrong. Things may be right or wrong, but reality is. And this beingness of reality is beyond all controversy, beyond all classification as we know such possible terms. So in finding or searching for a word, or a phrase, or a term suitable for this, the philosophers, and to a measure at least, the Orphics, came upon a simple statement for this particular uh, level, this total monadal essence. They called it the principle of principles. They said of it that it is a principle because it is first. Also, that it is a principle because it is an archetype, or a rule, or a law, or a guide, by means of which all other things are. It is forever re revealing itself through its works, and the, the revelation is always a revelation of principles. Everything, therefore, that moves according to its own nature, and this the divine nature, is forever revealing its principles. Therefore, this energy, this eternal power, is the principle from which arises all principles as we know them in terms of law or energy or substance or classifications or categories or concepts or any division we wish to make, intellectual or material, in the forms and structures of nature. So this vast principle of principles to these peoples was sovereignty. It neither loved nor hated. It neither was for nor against. It existed forever in its own nature, forever fulfilling its own nature. And therefore, everything which it did of itself and by itself 
and because of the principle of principles by which it operated, everything so done, so produced, so engineered, so manifested, had to be good because there can be no other principle in nature. The Greeks were totally unaware of any anthropomorphism or any battle between eternal good and dark. Uh, their principles of evil, so-called, or their evil beings, were simply passing chimera, little incidents that arose in the tyrannies of men or in the, the uh, peculiar testings of providence. They had no major principle that could stand against the principle of good. It did not occur to them that such a thing could exist. Because of what would this adversary be composed? It could only be composed of the substance of the one. It could only have the mind of the one. It could only have the emotions of the one. And possessing all these things in vast measure, how could it revolt against its own similar? Therefore, they had no presumption of this nature. They had no fallen angel. They had no lapse kingdoms. They simply recognized that man and nature in their various relationships would occasionally stumble along for lack of insight. This stumbling they would call evil. But evil is simply man's ignorance of the truth. It has nothing to do with the substance and essence of being. Evil is man's misuse of the principle through ignorance or through selfishness. And as a result of misuse, the principle, instead of working with him, turns against him or seems to do so. It does not move at all. He has turned against it by the misuse of its principles. This results in the good appearing to be bad. But as soon as the wayward one has corrected himself and gone back in line, the bad then appears to be good again. These things are forever moving and changing. Mm -hmm. So we have at the beginning this eternal monad. 